In the 1990s, a new breed of railroad cars emerged that used cryo-CO2 to cool their perishable loads instead of mechanical refrigeration. A company called Cryotrans, owned by the MHW Group, operated these 70-foot-long reefers. Cryotrans Incorporated, a.k.a. CTI, secured a patent in 1986 for a cryogenic rail car which revolutionized the frozen railroad industry. Between 1986 and 1995, CTI developed long-term leases for approximately 500 of these cars. Today, Cryotrans still operates a large fleet of cryogenic reefers across North America, and while several different types of these reefers exist, they all serve the same purpose. They're used to haul anything that is perishable over long distances. Cryogenic and also insulated reefer cars are something akin to a glorified picnic cooler or a giant thermos bottle, unlike the mechanical reefers, which are more like giant refrigerators or freezers on wheels. The cryogenics used liquid carbon dioxide, aka CO2, as their refrigerant. Liquid CO2 is discharged and flashes to both vapor and snow, chilling the car to well below zero. The snow sublimes for the rest of the trip while pulling heat out of the car, maintaining the cold temperature. If you've ever discharged a CO2 fire extinguisher, then you would have seen this happen. The discharge is liquid which flashes to vapor and snow at ambient temperatures. The cars in the 1100 and 1400 series were used RBLs converted to RCs. Cryotrans reporting mark CRYX bought hundreds of new mechanical reefers from Gunderson over the years which were in the 3000, 4000 and 5000 number series. Cryogenic reefers were not suitable for anything other than frozen commodities, which is why you still saw the mechanicals in operation. They were less complex than mechanicals, and the only thing that rendered them non-competitive was when the liquid CO2 got too expensive. In 2000 and 2001, due to an inordinate increase in the price of CO2, the majority of the fleet was converted to mechanical refrigeration. The Cryotrans fleet has been 100% mechanically cooled for years now, not even a museum piece left as far as I know. The current Cryotrans fleet of reefers consists of 340 64 foot mechanically refrigerated reefers, 1050 72 foot mechanically refrigerated reefers, and 701 68 foot insulator reefers which are the kind that you typically see around here. One of the last shippers that used the old Cryotrans car as an actual CO2 service was the JR Simplot company and I'm talking about the subsidiary out of Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Today, most, if not all, of the modern CO2 cars have been converted to mechanical refrigeration with the old Plate C 60-foot cars having largely been scrapped. CRYX number 3454 is one of the more rare types. It has no external refrigerator unit and has a 10-foot door. It also has no name on its doors unlike the vast majority of the CRYX reefers. Without the external refrigeration unit, 3454 lacks any cooling source, therefore it relies on its insulation to keep things cool enough. This car is 73 feet, 8 inches long on the outside, with 6,854 cubic feet of space on the inside making it bigger on the inside than most other Cryotrans cars. The newer 74-foot mechanically refrigerator cars are equipped with state-of-the-art two-way GPS systems with all or most being leased to major food processing companies. But there's something else very special about this car. Take a look at that logo. Notice how it covered up something else. Based on the blue excess height bands on the ends and the large patch visible behind the Cryotrans logo, it looks like those might be XGATX Arcticar Cryo Reefers that are now in service as large RBLs, since they would still be well insulated. When I looked them up in the ORER, that's the Official Railway Equipment Register, I found that they're listed as RC class cars with dimensions about what you would expect the Arcticar dimensions to be. So the real question is whether they're still being used as RC cars or as RBLs. The original cars had the red CO2 warning labels on the car sides near the A end. The CSX UMLER lists the car as AAR type R690. That's a cryogenic reefer, but that database has been wrong before. As mentioned earlier, there were other fleets of cryogenically cooled reefers at one time. The JR Simplot cars come to mind for me. The newer JRSX cars, built as reefer series in the 6000 to 6050 and 6100 to 6149 number series, are still mostly in service, minus a few retirees. But the older 5000 series cars that were rebuilt from the old cotton belt box cars have been retired due to the age of the original equipment. And from what I can tell by their car type code, they have not been rebuilt into mechanically cooled cars. Most of the Furex cars in the 690,000 number series, that's FURX, are still in existence. 
the XTRX cryogenic cars in the 200 to 242 number series that were rebuilt from the Western Pacific RBLs are gone, though. Lamb Weston, which is a division of the ConAgra company, had about two dozen cryo cars at one point. But when they performed a thermal imaging of all of the cars, they found that most of them were poorly insulated, so they sold them, and the new owners re-insulated the cars and applied mechanical cooling units. Hopefully that was enough information for those who complain that I don't talk enough about those cryotrans box cars. In our last stop, we looked at reusables. Looking north, we see the Reading and Northern's Kaiser Valley Industrial Track. Sunrise in Scranton is the start of another day for several railroads in northeastern Pennsylvania. The Reading and Northern's PISB is a local train that provides first and last mile switching services for several industries in Taylor and Scranton via the Kaiser Valley Industrial Track. The Kaiser Valley Track was once the home of the Lackawanna Railroad and its large yard and shops. Today, it's the home of the Reading and Northern Railroad and several of its customers. The biggest customer bar none is the massive cane warehouses. They can receive up to a dozen or more insulated and cryogenic boxcars such as the BX-166 that we talked about in Box Stars Part 1. ID Logistics, one of Europe's leading contract logistics providers, recently completed the acquisition of 100% of Kane Logistics here in the United States. 
Founded in 1930 by the Kane family, Kane's Omnichannel Logistics provides value-added warehousing, packaging, fulfillment, cross-stocking, and truckload services to large-volume shippers of consumer goods, food and beverage, and wine and spirits products. The company operates 20 contract packaging and product distribution hubs across the United States, representing close to 8 million square feet of space. The cane box cars are cut away to be spotted later in the day. And while conductor Sam hops on board, I can take a minute to tell you about today's workload. The first car, that center beam that's loaded with lumber, is going to be the first to be dropped off. It's going to 7D Lumber, located about a mile up the line. Prior to 2017, 7D Lumber was the single sole customer on the Diamond Branch track that's owned by the Northeastern Regional Rail Authority and operated by the Delaware Lackawanna. It received boxcars of various types, including high cubes, along with a rare center beam from time to time. Don't know what happened or how it went down, but somewhere along the way, the RNN was able to wrangle that business away from the DL in 2016 and move it over to its ostensibly greener pastures on the west side of town where 7D Lumber resides to this very day. All is not lost though. The Diamond Branch has since been revitalized with a new customer as I'll be highlighting in a future video. Kane helps consumer goods manufacturers and their retail partners efficiently and effectively distribute goods throughout the United States. ID Logistics is an international contract logistics group that manages 360 sites across 17 countries representing nearly 8 million square meters of warehousing facilities in Europe, America, Asia, and Africa with almost 28,000 employees. With a client portfolio balanced between the retail industry, detail picking, healthcare and e-commerce sectors, ID Logistics is characterized by offers involving a high level of technology.
Combining the ID logistics and Kane logistics organizations will give customers strong logistics capabilities across the United States, Europe, Asia, and Africa with similar operating approaches at all facilities. Both companies have an asset light business model with a focus on operating facilities dedicated to individual customers where solutions are custom designed to meet precise customer needs. With the addition of Kane to ID Logistics existing activities in the United States, the new entity, ID Logistics US, has revenues of $350 million with 3,000 associates across 26 high-volume, high-turn distribution and packaging centers. Kane Logistics Management Team will manage all ID Logistics U.S. activities. Once the center beam has been dropped, the train will go a little further north to the Scranton runaround track, run around the boxcars, head back this way and about another one mile behind us and spot them at the day's second customer. Now at that customer, note that third box car behind the locomotives. That's the empty that was picked up at 7D wholesale when the center beam was set out.
Conductor Sam and Engineer Ronnie are headed back up to the Kane warehouse where they'll wait for the empty boxes to be released later in the afternoon. Once cleared to do so, the empties will be pulled out and the loads put in, much like you saw with the first two customers. Once the Kane warehouse has been served, the crew will go north again to the Scranton runaround and just like the first time, run around the empties to bring back home to Pittston Yard. Along the way, they'll pick up the empty Hartford and Slocum, that's the HS boxcar that was just dropped along with the now empty rail box and Mississippi Delta Railroad boxcars. Just call it another day in Scranton, PA.